Good morning, everyone, and welcome very uh, warmly to today's 21st webinar on uh, issues affecting regional, rural and remote Australia as a result of the COVID pandemic. My name's Kate Charters, and I'm the chair of the National Steering Committee for SEGRA. And SEGRA is the acronym for Sustainable Economic Growth for Regional Australia. SEGRA is very committed to ensuring that the voice of those who live, work and invest in regional Australia is heard um, at the highest levels of decision making um, in government, but also is committed to um, providing opportunities for people who live, work and invest in regional Australia for professional development and training. So it's great to have um, you all here today. I'd like to particularly welcome uh, to um, conversationalists today. Firstly, I'd like to wel warmly welcome Jen Cleary. Jen is also a member of the National Steering Committee um, for SEGRA and has been for um, eight years now. So she's been a fantastic contributor um, to the SEGRA conferences that are held each year. Um, Jen is also the CEO of Centre Care Catholic Country SA, a social services agency providing services across regional, rural and remote South Australia. She holds an honorary position as Associate Professor in the Centre for Global Food and Resources at the Adelaide, University of Adelaide. So uh, welcome, Jen, and thank you very much for being part of today's conversation. I'm also pleased to introduce and welcome back Ian Doyle. Ian Doyle is a journalist with many years experience, particularly in um, issues affecting regional, uh, rural and remote Australia. So welcome Ian as well. Okay. Um, can I just please also encourage you to um, join in the conversation using the chat box. Um, Ian and Jen will be able to see questions as they come up there um, and uh, uh, be pleased to have, invite other people into the, into the conversation. So Jen, I guess we should start um, with you, but we should also start by identifying what we mean by regional, rural and remote Australia. Well, Kate, that's a terrific um, opening uh, because what is regional, rural and remote Australia? Um, I guess some key points for me is that there is no real description of that. Um, there's no one size fits all. And I've got a saying that if you've seen one country town, you've seen one country town because they're all different. Um, I guess I'd invite our participants um, to perhaps send in their thoughts on chat about what they think regional, rural and remote Australia is. Um, I guess when I think about Triple R Australia, as I call it, uh, it could be as diverse as somewhere like Dubbo, um, Wagga Wagga, Charters Towers, Wyala, Crystal Brook, Port Augusta, Busselton and Harvey Bay and Oodnadatta. Um, all of those places really are in regional, rural or remote Australia. Um, and uh, each of them is unique and different. Here's something that's a bit interesting, Jen. Uh, I've seen a fellow draw a map of Australia on the dirt on the Burzel track, and he says that RRR is actually in here. It's actually in your heart. If you actually have or understand what it is, what it means to be in that part of the country, or understanding what remoteness is about, then you carry rural Australia in your heart. And I know that's not the level we're talking at today, but. It's just the observation and it's very difficult to define what that regional, rural and remote is really about. Because if you ask the people who are living in those places, do they feel as if they're in a remote location? Most of them will tell you that we're so flat out living our lives, you know, the remoteness is not something that comes to their mind. It's our uh, appreciation or approach to the way things are done that people put remote in. Anyway, I just say that in passing. Yeah, okay. um, it's an interesting point because for those of us who live, uh, in that part of the world, the places that are remote um, are really places like Canberra. Um, so, um, you know, it's not remote if you live there. It's not remote if you live there. Look, some of the things I think we would like to cover off on today um, are some, some key take home messages, I guess, um, that we'll get to talk about. Uh, and those are really one that we've just touched on, which is that 
that regional rural and remote Australia is not a generic space. Uh, therefore, it's not a generic policy space. So any, any policy enactment needs to be able to recognise that there are unique differences across regional rural and remote Australia and that one size just doesn't fit all. And we can talk about that uh, in more detail. Uh, I, I particularly, I suppose, wanted to focus today on what are the impacts um, now and into the future of something like COVID-19 uh, and, and what will that mean for regional, rural and remote Australia beyond the pandemic whenever, whenever, that, whenever we get to that point? And, and what might the new normal be for regional, rural and remote Australia? Because I actually think there's probably, uh, well, there's undoubtedly some challenges for us in the future. I also think there's some opportunities and, um, you know, I, I, I kind of want us to, it's not all negative, it's not all bad, it's horrible. It is absolutely, you know, it's been horrific um, going through something like this, but what can we learn? What can we take forward? And uh, what, uh, what can we turn into an opportunity, I guess? Um, and uh, I think some of those challenges, there's, there's this thing I call lag time in um, in in some communities in uh, in regional Australia particularly um, and and communities that are very path dependent that that rely on single industries for example for their economic um, stability are particularly vulnerable to this thing I call lag time mm. um, so you know, it'd be good to talk about that if we get time and uh, uh, the other thing is that in my experience of regional, rural and remote Australia, the social and economic attributes of our communities are so closely interwoven that any policy that impacts our space needs to consider that those two domains are almost inextricably linked. And so we need to, con you can't consider one without the other. Um, so that's, that's my starting point, Ian. Thank you very much, Jen. That was fantastic. Now that view that we're looking at behind you is obviously very close that, to your heart and it's where you actually live, isn't it? It is, that sunrise from uh, my balcony, which is about 15 kilometers uh, on the Western side of Spencer Gulf, south of Port Augusta. So that's looking straight across Spencer Gulf at the Flinders Ranges there in the background. So. Looking across that water, we're looking at both Nukana and Adnyamadna country. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a view I never get tired of. And, you know, those, those who see me on Facebook see very often that I'm posting photos of that view. Now I can see Kate nodding there. It's a wonderful space indeed. All that uh, blue bush country just further south from where you are on the right hand side there towards Wyala is fantastic. Uh, how well prepared are we, do you think, Jen, given you've identified the fact that you, uh, and, and this lag time stuff is important, and I want to talk about the bubble effect, because what you are referring to is an article which you directed me to, to have a look at. Could you just give us a heads up about that first, so that people can go back and reference it as a, as a note-taking system, really? The article appears in Eureka. What just talk me through how we can get access to it, how people... Can oh, OK. So if, if um, to access that article, uh, it is uh, has been published by Eureka Street. So if you Google Eureka Street, uh, it'll come up. And uh, if you search search that, um, we can probably find a link, Kate, maybe, and put it onto the um, the chat, the, yep. ch the, the chat feature there. Um, and... So, uh, yeah, but that, that uh, it is something that I wrote. I had some really quite serious concerns about uh, some of the narrative that we were hearing uh, about uh, uh, what, um, you know, how, how well we're doing. And we are. We, you know, there is absolutely no doubt that Australia um, generally has taken a good approach, I think, to managing the impacts of this pandemic. What I love is that we actually privileged people over profits. 
Um, and, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's been stuff in the media about, uh, oh, you know, we should have taken the Swedish approach, etc. Well, it turns out that that's probably not such a good thing to have done. Um, so, you know, in that sense, we, we, we are very lucky in that we have taken that approach. Um, and I think that um, because of that, it's put us in uh, the sort of position where we can step back, we can take a look, we can look, look at the future, we can, and we can plan for it. That's really important. Important that we get the policy levers right. Um, and in our context, regional, rural and remote Australia, uh, we need to um, be mindful of things like, you talked about the bubble effect. Um, when we have economic stimulus, the, there is generally a sense of, uh, you know, people will spend, uh, it will, you know, the money circulates, it will go around, uh, and, that, and that's no different in regional, rural and remote Australia, except for one thing. Those populations are quite concentrated, so that economic spend is quite concentrated. And uh, in the initial stages, that's fabulous, because even with the kind of economic leakage that you might get with, you know, spend to the supermarkets, etc., uh, it still does generate this this happy little bubble for a while. But um, what happens is that uh, once that money is gone, the um, the the and that can that can take quite a while. Remember, it's quite concentrated in in some of our smaller communities. Um, once that money is gone then we are left with the situation that for some of us, we saw, for example, in Wyala, when, uh, when the um, situation happened, when what I call the perfect storm, some of our upper Spencer Gulf cities, we saw the shutdown of the power station at Port Augusta and we saw the downturn in mining and we saw the challenges that one still faced. When all those things happened, it was a bit like a perfect storm. And yet, in one of those communities, the car dealers said it was the best, the six months immediately following that period, they said it was the best six months that they'd had. And, and clearly that was about people had redundancy money, they had, you know, they had some money. Um, once that money was gone, we saw a significant deepening of what we described as newly poor in those communities. And um, the, the newly poor in those communities were people who had never experienced that level of hardship previously. Therefore, they had no understanding of where to go, what to do, and, and how to manage um, their situation of being newly poor. Um, and so, yeah, people, um, once the money was gone, people tended, if they, if they had the capacity to move on and the skills, you know, um, skills to be able to work somewhere else, they moved on. And we ended up with depopulation with all of its associated challenges in those communities. And we definitely saw that. Now, you've raised Wyala. I'd like to talk about Mr Gupta, but I, I, you may, just in terms of the technical, your approach to how you describe the issues that are affecting uh, regional communities as a result of the downturns that occur and that lag time dash aftershock. Would you put some meat on that bone, please, Jen? Okay. So, so the aftershock is uh, well, what happens when you know when that economic bubble, when that you know, the happy bubble, when that sort of explodes or whatever. Uh, what you see is firstly a depopulation. So those who can move will move. Um, and those who um, can move are those who have um, transferable skills. So they'll move somewhere for, for another job. But there will be others in the community uh, who can't move. And they can't move because they may have invested in properties. They may have debt, which actually holds them in place. So they can't, they literally can't afford to move. Or they don't have skills that enable them to move, um, to, to work elsewhere. Um, so you've got this, firstly, this hollowing out of the community. So those who can move, do move. So you're left with um, a cohort of people who um, generally have debt. And we saw that. We saw much more debt than equity in property settlements, for example. Um, they are not able to 
you know, they don't have a general knowledge of uh, where you can go to get supports. Um, and what that means is that if there is suddenly some other economic opportunity that might happen in that community, you actually, because of the depopulation, you don't have the people or the demographic who can respond well to that economic opportunity. So therefore you get this, what I call the lag, which means that the recovery in those communities is much longer than you might see somewhere else where you have a where you don't have thin markets where you don't have depopulation um, and, and 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 a good example of that i think in COVID, this COVID time is perhaps the ndis the disability space particularly where we have seen in regional communities it's already quite difficult to get qualified workers in uh, some parts of regional rural and remote australia so, for example, if you look at degree qualifications, if you look at tertiary qualifications, the further remote that you get, the lower the percentage of people who have tertiary qualifications. It's quite difficult to attract uh, some allied health professions, for example, to regional, rural and remote communities. So you spend a lot of time either trying to recruit or trying to grow your own workforce. And then people with those skills, when, when uh, what happened, happened as a result of COVID-19, some agencies lost uh, up to you know, 80 to 90% of their income because people weren't accessing services in this market environment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with no income, you have to lay off staff or you have to stand them down and the, the first thing those people will do is move to a place where they can access work. So therefore, you're starting right at the bottom again when things improve. Um, and when it's already difficult to attract a qualified workforce, you're starting behind the eight ball. So therefore, recovery is a lot longer. And I hope that makes sense. It does. But did you, do you believe that COVID has, has fast forwarded what was already starting to appear in regional rural Australia before COVID, was there a, the, the pressures on the health system, the pressures on population, the pressures on uh, skill bases and so forth, was that well underway in a very steady long-term downtrend before COVID's gone bang and, and you know, forced everything to fall very quickly? How the anticipation of coming out of here is that we sort of you know, all jump up and all everything bounces back. My impression is that that's not going to happen. How do you feel about that? Oh, it definitely isn't going to happen. And I can tell you, and it definitely is not going to happen in regional, rural and remote Australia. Um, and where, you know, the cities might be starting to recover, places that are more rural and remote will be another six to 12 months behind that. Um, I can almost guarantee it. Um, and, um, and, and that, I think, in terms of policy responses, is what we need to be mindful of. Um, and and uh, again, um, economic policy in regional, rural and remote Australia, for example, uh, what might work in the city might not work in, uh, in a country, country community. And um, if I think about things like, um, we tend to, I talked earlier about the social and economic domains and how they can't be separated. Um, if you lose population in a country community, you're losing volunteers, you're losing people with skills who can write funding grants for sporting bodies, who can coach teams, who can add value in so many other ways. So that's, you know, that's part of the social component. Um, and those people with those skills, well, once they move out, you, you're kind of left with this hollowing out effect. Um, and then if on top of that, you um, have lost the economic contributions of those people, it, it, you know, it paints a pretty dire picture, really. Well, it can. Um, one thing I'll, I'll mention is that um, in terms of the connections between the social and economic, and those being intertwined. Uh, in, in that Eureka Street article that you talked about, I, I referenced some research that was um, done by the, uh, um, uh, the 
it's gone out of my brain. They are done by the university, a team of researchers at the University of South Australia anyway, the Australian Association, the Australian Social Alliance, I think it is. Anyway, what they did was they measured the contribution of social services organisations, community services organisations, for example, in country communities. And what they found it, it, was it, it, that... The multiplier effect you're about to talk about. Isn't it? Yeah, it is the multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect of investment by government in those agencies was 2.3 to the local economies. So, you know, that's pretty significant. What I mean by this connection between the social and the economic. You, look, you keep on saying things I want to jump in and talk about. You know, you, you raised the politics. I'd like to come back and talk about the challenges of sure. regional in a moment and the opportunities that were offered and the and the uh, maybe the cardboard cutout of what might have happened with the Gillard, you know, the three musketeers and they joined up and what that meant for regional Australia. Did that Was that an opportunity as a blueprint for the future, maybe? Uh, and a couple of other things that you raised I'd like to come back to. But the, the Gupta story, the one in Wyala that, I think most people who'd be listening or watching at the moment would know about Mr. Gupta, the uh, venture capitalist person who's come across from the UK and has basically, uh, a, 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 from the outside looking in, Jen, looked like Wyala was on its knees and I don't know where it is now. I mean, how, how, it, 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 there's been a lot of talk about what he's been doing or about to do and so forth. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about in terms of trying to get regional and rural and remote areas um, up and away by having that's one example of what could happen to actually change things by people coming from the outside planting themselves and adding their skill set or their connections or whatever to it is the Gupta story a good story for regional Australia I think the Gupta story is probably a mixed story for regional Australia um, I think actions always speak louder than words. And um, and I, I think what's happening is that we are seeing them playing out of some of those actions in Wyala. Um, and we're seeing the playing out of some of those words in Wyala. Um, and so, I, you know, the, the, again, to, you know, use another meme, the proof of any pudding is in the eating. And um, I will be very happy when we see that, you know, Mr. Gupta has achieved his goal of um, running his steelworks by um, renewables. Uh, renewables. Um, so I think the jury's still out on that one, Ian, uh, about whether the Gupta story is a good story or, or, or it's something else. Um, there are very many people, all of us, who have any association <coughs> with Wyala and the surrounding region um, who are very hopeful that what Mr Gupta is is doing is a very positive thing for our communities. Um, but again, it, it, it actually, what it does though, it highlights the, um, the situation of where you have a, a, an economically path dependent community um, because Wyala <clears throat> and to some extent the surrounding region is a little bit locked into that um, to that industry. That's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, you know, people are good at that. It's what they do. Um, our demographic is geared towards that. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. What I'm saying though, is that it does present with risk when you do get a shock. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, you know, when you have a workforce and a demographic that is so tightly connected to that single industry. Just had a note from, um, Catherine McKenzie, uh, who was one of the researchers who conducted that research I was talking about, it's the Australian Alliance um, of social, for Social Enterprise uh, at the University of South Australia. Thank you, Catherine. That's it. Uh, let's hope the Japanese continue to eat tuna because I can tell you the Port Lincoln <laughs> community as a local community would be uh, significantly diminished if the Japanese decide they no longer want to eat shishumi tuna talking about having single railway lines that people are dependent on for their for their income. But is the Gupta model, just forget Mr. Gupta, but is the opportunity, what do you think of the, the possibility? Foreign of, investment, is foreign, that what well, you're talking about? Yeah, well, we'll get to the foreign investment. You can actually do it, it could be foreign investment, but the idea of actually having new people come into town with new ideas who are able to uh, inject capital and do things which will change the direction of the way a regional community is operating. 
it sort of adds the intellectual horsepower to the to the uh, to the operation, or, or adds to it, or makes it better. Um, and then we can look at the foreign foreign uh, investment. That that's that's a big number about big big opportunity. But is, are there people who can make a change by coming into regional Australia under the Gupta model to influence politics locally and I mean, there's no problems about Mr. Gupta getting a photograph for the Premier of South Australia and the Prime Minister. I mean, if he puts his hand up, everyone turns up. So there's there's a, a real desire for these people to succeed. I'm wondering how hard it's going to be to actually encourage other people to do the same sort of thing elsewhere around Australia. Oh, look, I think I think it always comes down to the. Um, you know, I, I'm uh, you know, I'm not a cynic, but it comes down to whether or not that regional place has some sort of asset that um, can be mobilised. So, you know, no one's going to go and invest in a community where there's nothing to invest in. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the investment of Mr Gupta, for example, in, in, in Wyala and the Steelworks was because there was something there that he saw that could be an asset that could be mobilised and made better. Um, it's the same sort of thing uh, if we look at somewhere like King Island, for example. Tiny little island, um, makes fantastic dairy products um, and has had that foreign investment. Um, I suppose, again, it's a two-sided coin because there are positives and there are negatives. One of the positives is that you do get that investment. It does mean jobs for the community. It means it means money goes around. It means money circulates in that in that economy. Um, the other side to that, though, is how do you make sure? How do you make sure as a as a, a regional community who is impacted by that investment? How do you make sure that you capture the value as much of that value as you possibly can for your regional community? That is always the challenge, and that relies on um, uh, either it, it relies either on the well on a number of things: the savvy of the people who are there, the regulatory environment in which uh, that that investment is occurring, um, and and uh, it also uh, it relies to some extent on on the policy that surrounds that. So not just the regulatory environment, but the policy levers that are in place. Um, to support that um, external investment, so the, you know that exogenous investment um, and the, uh, the the level of value that can then um, attribute locally or regionally or nationally. Okay, so the international investment from people like China and America and so forth is that a tick in the box for regional Australia? Possibly. Um, again, I, you know, I'm not going to say yes or no because remember at the start I said there is no one size fits all. Yep. Um, and so what might work in one place might not work in the other. Uh, so, for example, if we take uh, somewhere like, oh, well, let's take King Island. Um, fantastic dairy products, fantastic dairy products come out of King Island. Um, and if you've ever had, you know, a King Island triple brie, um, it's to die for. And, um, and your cardiologist says, stop doing that, Jen. Yeah, exactly. I know. But, but, and here's the rub, the, the milk producers on King Island are not getting any more money for the milk that they produce um, than anyone anywhere else on the mainland. So, you know, there's not been that value capture locally. Um, and that, to me, is concerning. We won't go into the GM lifting of that uh, situation and the moratorium in South Australia has been on for a very long time. That's an interesting discussion in itself about getting paid more for producing stuff that's non, that's GM free and so forth. But there are various examples around the place. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. No, I'm not. <laughs> you, you spoke yesterday, because we had a chat yesterday, you spoke to me about Australia as a donut. What do you mean oh. by that? Oh, yep. Yeah. And, 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 and again, that cuts to what I've just been talking about. How do you capture the value? Because at the moment, we, we either dig it up, we plant it and then harvest it um, and then off it goes. Now, look, you know, in, in a country like Australia where you've got this really big space, a really thin population and thin markets, if you're a farmer, it makes sense to put as much, to plant and grow, to grow as much as you can grow, get it on one truck, going to one place, to one buyer, once. 
because the distances, et cetera, and the, uh, uh, you know, the transaction costs are so high. That makes sense. Mm. But also, that, that also comes with risk because then you are locked into that model. Um, so therefore, capturing value is really difficult. Um, and we've seen some um, interesting examples of that um, over time, I think, where fantastic Australian products don't necessarily get the recognition as Australian products um, and therefore run the risk of being substituted by something else. Um, at the minute, you know, Australia pretty much trades on, in agricultural produce, we, we trade on clean and green. Um, but what happens when other countries catch up and can do it cheaper? You know, that to me is the risk. Um, and, and of course, agriculture, where does that happen? It happens in regional, rural and remote communities. Um, so um, not capturing value means that it's quite, agriculture is quite extractive. Not capturing value in mining means that mining is quite extractive. Um, so, you know, uh, that's, that to me is the donut. It's just, you know, most, of, most of that stuff is happening in, in, you know, kind of the middle bit of Australia and um, it's like, it has the potential to leave a big hole. I remember 30 years ago, Jed, and the suggestion was that Russia didn't have to invade Australia. All they had to do was keep buying our wheat because if they kept buying our wheat, the extractive nature of wheat taking nutrient out of the soil, unless you replace it, you'll eventually turn the place into a desert. So you won't have to invade it, you'll just send everybody broke. No, oh, well, you know, it's, it's a bit like water as well, because that's what we're exporting, isn't it? It is. That's another. We could spend an hour and a half just talking about that subject. Uh, a couple of other things you said yesterday were particularly interesting. Talk to me about social networks and why are they important in relation to the issues we're talking about today? Well, in just the same way that kindness can spread really quickly, and we've seen that, you know, not just in regional, rural and remote communities, but the acts of kindness and giving and generosity that we've seen during this pandemic, you know, have been, it's, it's been an absolute joy to witness that and be part of that. Um, but those same social networks and quite dense social networks in smaller communities, for example, can just as easily spread um, you know, disharmony and, um, and, and perhaps fear, anxiety and, and worry about the future. And so it, it kind of concerns me that um, it's, the, it's the positive and the negative, I suppose, of being a really connected, having really connected communities, smaller communities, um, is that those things can spread very quickly. Um, at the same time, it means that um, we can we can quickly reach people when the, when they have needs as well. Um, so you know it's one of the, it's one of the the blessings I suppose of of country communities. Um, it's also it's also one of the the downsides of country communities. We've got uh, Karen who's from Port Lincoln who obviously is listening very closely to the conversation in relation to the tuna industry in Port Lincoln. And the potential, she says, the opportunity for the tuna industry to look to alternative markets and alternative value add, uh, she thinks is a great opportunity. Well, um, the challenge with that one, Karen, is that uh, about 85% of the, uh, the material that comes out of Port Lick, and you're quite right, uh, it does go to Japan. And it's only based on the fact they like eating sashimi that this thing's taken off over the past 40 years. Regional tourism is an opportunity. You know, there's a boat there called the Tacoma, which, of course, could be the basis of, <laughs> of uh, Port Lincoln's future. Anyway, that's another political story we could talk about sometime later. Um, all right. So let's go back to the politics of it all. You talk, you know, how seriously do you think people in, in the remote area of Canberra that you referred to, that's where the isolation is occurring, which I thought was an interesting uh, observation. Um, how seriously do you think they take regional Australia? Seriously, um, they take regional Australia. Well, I think I think the uh, you know the honest answer to that is is as seriously as they need to. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, any of the deals that have been done for regional, rural, and remote Australia politically have come out of uh, a need to um, form government. Generally, um, happened under you know in the in the Gillard era 
for example, and regional Australia scored, some parts of regional Australia scored fairly well um, out, of, out of that. Um, I think uh, there, there's, there's a piece of work that was done some time ago, a uh, very good piece of work that talked about the power to persuade and how in times past where, you know, a significant portion of the population lived in regional, rural and remote Australia, and a significant portion of the wealth resided in regional, rural and remote Australia, um, meant that there was quite a lot of power um, that also resided in, in, uh, in our space. That's no longer the case because, you know, if you think of the donut, um, the, the donut idea, the power doesn't sit where the hole is. Um, so, so um, you know, I, I, I find it interesting that um, in terms of um, policy and policy making for regional, rural and remote Australia, um, I, I guess it's more, in my, in my view, it's, it's um, there's a level of uh, what I see as shifting. Um, so shifting responsibility, for example, for the economic success of regional, rural and remote Australia to regional, rural and remote Australia, but at the same time as not necessarily shifting the resources to be able to enable that. So um, it's a, it's a it, it, I think... Um, policy for regional, rural and remote Australia uh, can also be a little bit about um, uh, managing, um, uh, man managing um, political uh, capital uh, as, as much about policy. You're, um, choosing, you're choosing your words very carefully here. I am, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand yeah, the, why yeah, you need yeah. to do that as well. Of course you do. Uh, the the idea of actually having a commission for regional and rural and remote Australia, something which is a filter that you... Policy you know, filter. A policy filter. You know, uh, I, I, I didn't intervene to say, really, it's, it's simply about how many votes are there out there. They don't count because there's not enough of them and they won't change it. And we've only got to concentrate on those things that will determine whether government is whether we hold government or not. If you've got a commission which is capable of filtering material and, and working out how it can advantage or not or not disadvantage regional Australia, it's attached to the federal parliament in some form. This is starting to sound a bit like statement from the heart by the Aboriginal community that didn't which didn't get a, much of a run. Um, is there a commission for re, re, regional rural Australia? Is that an idea? that you know, we, we spoke briefly about yesterday. Is there something that, that is, is in that idea? That's a major shift. It is a major shift. Uh, happened in, um, happened in uh, Canada a few years ago, um, whereby any, any policy that was enacted had to, had to pass through this filter. Uh, and and it, was it, was, uh, it was formed at both the national level and, and, and filtered down at the state level as well. Because don't forget, we've got this... You know, we've got some things are controlled federally, some things are con controlled at the state level, um, and that, that's always a bit tricky. Um, but I see it as a common sense approach to policy enactment um, in regional, rural and remote Australia because, because of that, you know, one size doesn't fit all challenge. Because we have states and territories, because we have, you know, federation, um, because we have all these things kind of um, some, sometimes supporting each other, but sometimes at odds, um, something that existed that could filter uh, decisions that impact regional, rural and remote communities, I think would be really sensible. Let me give you an example. Now, a decision by an education department, so state, state or territory responsibility, a decision by an education department to suddenly, uh, to, to, to have a review of their rural school bus routes and decide that one's viable, that one's not viable. Okay, let's pull that one and that one. It's not, it's not gonna affect that many people. It's, you know, it's only 
you know, probably 20 or 30 people, it's going to affect, yeah, no, that's not going to cause much, much of a challenge. Causes a huge challenge. Complaint. Oh, great challenge, but not much of a complaint. Not, you know, we can, we can handle that problem either by ignoring it or, or just, you know, giving them a sop for something or other. Mm. Sorry, I inter I inter let, me tell, let me tell you what the flow on effects of that are. And it cuts again to my point about the social and economic domains being totally interwoven. So you cut a rural school bus route. That, what that does is suddenly 10 families have to decide, am I going to continue to have my children at the local area school or is it actually going to be cheaper for me to try and get a subsidy and actually send them off to school in Adelaide mm -hmm. or wherever or Brisbane or Sydney? Um, and, 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 <laughs> and, and when that happens, um, what, what happens then is we lose numbers that are probably fairly thin anyway in a local area school, which means you might lose half a teacher. Losing half a teacher is sometimes worse than losing a whole teacher because half a teacher means losing a whole teacher anyway because that teacher needs to pay a mortgage or whatever. So they're going to move off to somewhere else. But not only that, they coach the local basketball team. They actually make a contribution to the local council because they've gotten themselves elected as a local councillor. So they're deeply embedded in the social fabric mm. of that community. And, and of course, they're making an economic contribution because their salary is spent largely in that local community. So taking out a rural school bus route um, impacts not just at that family level, it might save an absolute you know, tiny amount of money for the department, but it impacts that community seriously because, because if you haven't got a basketball coach, you haven't got a basketball team, you haven't got a basketball or a netball team, then you're not actually doing the, you know, the movement around communities, which often happens to play, you know, football and netball and all of those other sporting things. And then having the social interaction afterwards and the economic activity that comes with supporting the club who's providing the meals. So do you see what I mean? That's that's what I mean by that social and those social and economic domains are really tightly interwoven and they have serious impacts when you you know when you poke one or the other of them. Social geography you are, aren't you? Yeah, I am. You are. That was just fantastic just to hear you say that. It just, you know, it, it ticks all the boxes in terms of the the the, the, the the understanding of the implications of actions that result in things further away. Unintended consequences. Un and that's what we could yeah. fix with some sort of policy filter. Yeah. You think that would ever happen? You know, I mean, Dean, uh, Dean Jench, who's the political anal uh, analyst in, or one of, in, in South Australia, political anal uh, analyst, talks about regional rural Australia will stay the way ours until such time they all change their votes until such time as they actually shape the system to, to ensure that those who are making the decisions on their behalf actually hear what their concerns are as opposed to placating the bumps that, that come along and, and enough to quieten them down. You know, I'm not suggesting everyone changes their vote, but the fact is that an observation would be that until people actually understand the significance of their vote and change the way they go about doing things, things won't change because the 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 the, uh, the Canberra lobbies are really cons you know they got more trouble in Western New in Sydney and and uh, downtown you know South East Queensland than they have about worrying about what happens at Durham Bandy or or uh, or Wagga or you know out out in the Northern Territory. I don't know. I just. Well, you know, again, it comes down to uh, it is a bit of a numbers game, isn't it, Ian? Um, so I'm not sure whether changing your vote would make a huge difference um, because, you know, do, do we really have a... Well, this is getting a bit contentious, but do we really have a right and a left anyway? No. Or do we have some sort of populist middle? No. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. What I do know, what I do know is that recent uh, research that was... Um, commissioned by, well, it was commissioned by, you know, uh, unashamedly, Catholic Social Services Australia. Um, and what that research found was that the uh, most disadvantaged 
electorates, federal electorates in Australia are in, guess where? Regional, rural and remote Australia. So, Re so... Represented largely, represented largely by National Party. Yeah, that's Senate. right. That's yeah. exactly right. So, you know, one of, one of the things I suppose, one of the policy levers here could be that if you take something like the Marmot Report, which, you know, happened in, which was done in England, um, but actually really uh, looked at those, um, the relationship between disadvantage and the social determinants of health. Mm. Guess what? In the 10 year review that they did, those, elect, those areas that were most disadvantaged had much poorer health outcomes. My big concern is that if in regional, rural and remote Australia, Australia takes at the federal level some sort of austerity position, because really the period of that Marmot review, that 10 year review was in that period of austerity policy in the UK. Now that is terribly concerning to me because the electorates most at risk are those in regional rural, the people in regional rural and remote Australia. So where disadvantage is linked um, to those social determinants of health, austerity policy in this country is going to affect people in regional rural and remote Australia more than anywhere else. Karen in Port Lincoln uh, has come back and he, she has indicated very clearly that the bronze statue of the tuna fisher is sensational. If you haven't seen it, you need to go and see that, Jen. It, it was unveiled last year, I think, on the foreshore. And it is a fantastic piece of sculpture on the Port Lincoln foreshore. So, uh, Fiona has uh, made comments. Hi, Fiona. On... <laughs> uh, uh, it's a bit like doing the, uh, the late night quiz on, on the Delroy program. Everybody knew each other. Uh, the regional policy filter you talk about did occur for a period of time yeah, in Victoria, did. but it was incorporated across state departments rather than being set up as a separate authority. And she doesn't, and Fiona thinks it doesn't, uh, it, it didn't last long. And, and she thinks it, it operated around 2011, 2012. So people are, have had a swing at it, but it, it hasn't worked. I wonder why that's the case. People well, have if, if, it was, if it was connected to the state government departments, it's not really, uh, it's not really going to be, you know, I'm an idealist um, and I know Kate is too and she's smiling there at me, but what regional, rural and re remote Australia needs is, is credible independent voices, um, of which of course Segwa is one. Um, but but um, connecting something to a government department or government departments or government, um, I wonder, I wonder how successful that would be because there's always that underlying imperative, isn't there? Political imperative, um, um, depending on who's who's holding the power. So that you know that would again. That's I'm not a cynic, but I do sound like one. Mm. Well, justifiably so, Jen. Justifiably so. The challenge, I think, one of the the, the, the bigger picture question is about mm -hmm. trying to get agreement, even from regional Australia, about what it is that they want. You know, those big changing school starting dates or ages or whatever across the across the whole country. Uh, those are, you know, there's some obvious things that could be done to make things more uniform, so that people travelling from one place to the other around the country could be the same. I'm just thoughtful about the fact that people in communities have difficulty agreeing with the mob up the road, let alone the people from Victoria, if you're in South Australia, because you want to bell them up on the footy field and do everything else to them. I'm just thoughtful. How do you actually bring that essence of, of what is good for the whole of regional Australia when so many different uh, individual entities want different chunks of whatever the issue happens to be? that trying to get regional Australia to agree on what the issues are that need to be sorted by those in Canberra and elsewhere in itself would make a hell of a challenge to actually come up with those things. Well, you know, that's because uh, communities have to compete against each other. It's the dark side of social capital. Um, mm. Communities are set up, um, you know, if you're going for government funding, for example, um, I saw it, I saw it locally in commentary on social media. Um, uh, and, and it was framed in the sense of how come community A gets more from the government than community B? How come we don't get as much? 
um, and, and you know that that's about that's about competition, um, and you know the, the, the everything we do is about competition, um, and and everything uh, really when you think about it is mark is, is part of the market, um, even country communities in a sense. We've got ten minutes to go. Rob last week identified the fact that the speaker last week last week identified the fact that. Um, uh, communities were doing things like there'd be five council areas, Southern Air Peninsula, we're talking, that's where you are, um, uh, the Southern Air Peninsula and the uh, collectively put in for grants that come to that region and they take it in turns to get the maximum grant so that you know every third year you get the two million or the five million bucks and the others the other two miss out but the following year you don't compete for that money that's coming in, you get something so you can do something serious with it. Because he referred to it as the Vegemite effect, you know, just yep. spreading it thinly across the, you yep. know, filling up the gaps in the holes in the road. I'm just thought, um, I'm just that, thought uh, that, But there are, there are many examples of that, Ian, and it is particularly strong, I think, in our part of the world. Uh, the Regional Development Australia bodies, for example, the RDAs in yeah. South Australia, worked collectively to, um, prioritise infrastructure projects across the state and said, went to government and said, in, uh, in regional South Australia, these are the things that we think are most important from here, 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 here and here, and prioritise them. I know two communities who got their airports upgraded and they shall remain nameless, mm -hmm. but they got their airports upgraded because they cooperated and said, now you go this round and we'll go next round. Yeah. Um, because, mm, because if both of them put in in the same round, neither would have gotten um, gotten the outcome they wanted. So you know there is a need to do that. It's called what I call it's a it's something I call cooperation. Um, and you cooperate, you cooperate when it suits the 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 broader collective, recognizing that sometimes in the environment in which we exist, that you are going to have to compete. Um, so you know, there's, I'm seeing some. There's some pe people are suddenly coming out uh, alive. Yeah, well, there's Pe Penny got... Williams' comment. Yeah. Six or eight minutes to go. Uh, the Murray, uh, exactly right, Catherine. You've taken the words right out of my yeah, mouth. You know, exactly. the next thing is don't talk about water because we'll be we'll be there for a year. <laughs> but the Murray is a classic example of. Well, it's the people. tragedy of the commons, isn't it? It is exactly right. Exactly right, and the outcome of that is. You know, I don't know how how that's going to be resolved. If, if every time you go to the table, you get agreement, and then every time, three months or three years later, it all turns around, is really quite difficult. Uh, what Tony. Hi, Tony. Has asked, do you think, Tony has asked, do you think federal and state government uh, have these strategies right for regional Australia with respect to social and affordable housing? My goodness, we've only got six minutes, Jen. Off you go. <laughs> The um, short answer, Tony, is um, is no. I don't think they have um, necessarily. Um, but actually, Tony is is somebody who would know much more about that than me, anyway. Um, so um, I I I don't I don't think so necessarily. I think um, some places are perhaps doing it better than others. Um, but again, there's still uh, competition for funding for. Um, you know, between agencies, for example, is setting up things like competitive tendering. Like, you know, we've only got six minutes in, but if if you look at competitive tendering for whatever services we're talking about, and you have in the bush, uh, regional, rural, and remote Australia, you have agencies competing for funding um, because you know government policy says that's the best bang. That's how you get the best bang for buck. Mm. Problem is though. If I, as an agency, go for funding and, and my population is so thin that that funding can only support half a worker yeah. or one worker, just one worker, and then the next time the funding comes around, the, the government department, this has happened, this has happened many times, um, the government department goes, oh, we better give them some, we better give them some. So I've got half a worker, the other agency's got half a worker. We're scrambling to keep the people we've invested heavily in to grow them, um, you know, as capable workers. Um, and so we're scrabbling around looking for other money to keep people employed. So 
you know, I, you know, there's there's an argument to be made. I think that we look at um, funding distribution in a different way um, for regional, rural, and remote Australia. You know, competitive tendering is not always the. Kate's nodding. She knows mm. it's not always the best bang for buck. In fact, sometimes it costs governments more mm. um, to not be you know to be to do it as a competitive process the challenge is when you start talking about you know why why are funds provided to regional remote australia the 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 the, the sports exercise of you know you said you want a list going in to say these are the priorities for regional australia and then you see the sports you know that's a really interesting thing that is under discussion at the moment about how those things were allocated the same sort of thing would happen with regional Australia to the point where that competition on the basis of who votes and where they live, you know, I, look, I am the cynic. You're saying you're trying not to be, but the point is you just, the, the, the experience of the past 25, 30 yeah, years is such yeah, that you, yeah. you've got to say, how difficult would it be to actually put that into place? One, you've got to get them to agree. And two, once you get them to agree, then the people who are allocating the funds or the necessary input and thing have got to, you know, do it in a, hands off, you know, political manner and, and do as requested by the Australian community, Australian rural regional community. Big ask. It is. That's why, that's why they've got you uh, answering all these questions, Jim, because you've got the <laughs> answers to everything. <laughs> no. All right. Now, look, it's 26 minutes past, or in, in the case of the Eastern States, 5-2. Um, summary, what, what would you like... What is it a result of this fairly freewheeling conversation we've had? The, the message is that, that you want us to go away with and, and, and some things to do, you know? Um, anything that we can do, you know? Tell me something to do, Jen. I want to go and do something. Um, go to Canberra <clears throat> um, and tell the people there that one size doesn't fit all. That's the first thing. That's the first message. Okay. Think about... Think about regional, rural and remote Australia as something that is not the city. Um, it is not the city and therefore the things that you might do in the city, this is oversimplifying, but policy you might enact in the city may not work in um, regional, rural and remote communities. And everything that you do, you can bet your bottom dollar that it'll, it will have more unintended consequences in regional, rural and remote communities than it will anywhere else. Remember that the social and economic mm. domains, and to some extent the environment as well, the social and economic domains are inextricably linked. And the more remote you go, the more um, significant that effect is. Therefore, those unintended consequences, uh, you, you, you need to try and preempt them if you can. Um, and you, um, I, I suppose that those who live and work in regional, rural and remote Australia, um, but there are some voices um, that sometimes don't get heard and need to be heard. Um, we know our, we know our patch. We know what works. Um, we know what doesn't work. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's that sense of we'd love to be heard. Every time you say something of that nature, you know, I keep on thinking about First Nations people and their concerns about exactly those things that you've just raised about listening about we understand what needs to be done that you know it's just the connections between that group of people and 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 us and regional and remote australia not that i live there but i am it is in here in here uh is really quite interesting anyway look i've enjoyed the conversation there's a there's, the, there's a uh, survey that's being done uh, at the moment, which those who are looking on the chat line, and you will be sent the, the connection to it because uh, Kate would love you to, you know, participate in a survey because more data, more information makes more accurate, as, as the social geographer is nodding, um, makes uh, the outcome more reliable as the economist is speaking. Therefore, the result is that if you go and do the survey, that would be fantastic. Thank you all for participating this morning. Thank you for the comments uh, on the chat line. That was great. And Jen, that was great. I enjoyed... We, we, uh, we, there are lots, still lots to say, uh, but you know, we've only got an hour, so time's up. All right. 
I think unless Kate's got something to say, we're good for the morning. Yes, Kate. Wait, microphone, Kate. You got to yes. turn the microphone on. Yes. So is that right now? Yes. Yeah, well, listen. Thank you both, um, Jen and Ian, for a fabulous, fabulous session. I um, felt really quite inspired by it. Jen is really kick-starting our next stage of um, our webinars. We've been looking at how COVID has affected Australia, regional, rural, and remote Australia. But now we'll be looking at next steps about what we can do. And Jen has painted some fabulous pictures about uh, what we can do. Um, so you will get a survey um, emailed to you. If you could complete that, that, that would um, be great. And next Friday at 11 o'clock, we'll be um, starting up looking at the survey and starting to develop what we're calling an ideas lab, um, where we can, can capture ideas for uh, going forward. Thank you all very much, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you.